Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, actually, I've been with the agency since 1998 in a number of different capacities, not all with the grants office. So, um, but uh, first, um, I want to say uh, welcome, and um, it's good to be with you. I, uh, I actually work out of California, so uh, it took me a while to get here. <laughs> I came, flew in yesterday, so um, flew into San Antonio and then drove on down. So I, I got to see the great scenery from San Antonio down to McCollum, and uh, it was um, breathtaking. Yeah, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but uh, but anyway, this was my first time in this part of the part of the country, so um, so it's good to be here with you. And um, a couple of things before I, I start, I, I just want to let you know um, that the grant that we've given to MHM is the first SIF grant that we've given in the state of Texas, number one. Uh, number two, it's the largest SIF grant that we gave out last year. Um, you know, $5 million a year is a pretty sizable federal grant. And third, you're the recipients of all that. So you should feel, you should feel pretty special um, because I know you went through a rigorous selection process. So, you know, it starts off obviously with MHM applying to the federal government and going through that process and getting funded and awarded and then they go and sub grant out to you guys. So. Um, you're the beneficiaries of all that work, so you should feel, I think, a little special. And particularly since you're doing uh, work in, in areas of great need down here in, in, in Texas. And I think that's important because we had, haven't really had a significant SIF presence in Texas. So you'll be literally marking history in terms of social innovation fund here in Texas. Um, and that's, I think that's pretty important. And you're the first, so you have to understand that as the first, you're gonna be a little bit of the guinea pigs as well, so. <laughs> because that just comes, anyone, I'm sure all of you have at one point been in the first year of a new program and know how that goes, so you'll be a little bit of that. But, um, but you also have a very, very capable team behind you, so you're in, you're in really good hands in terms of the folks here at, at MHM. And to the degree that we can help and support Obviously, the grantees at the corporation, we will do that as well. Some of the things I may be talking about uh, may be repetitive of, of things you've already heard, so I may skip through a few things, and there's some things I may want to just, just kind of emphasize from the, you know, from the sub-grantee perspective. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about CNCS rules and laws, although those have been hit upon before in regulations. Uh, the grant terms and just general accepted financial principles and some of the things you may need to, to do. Now, we have the corporation is bound by <clears throat> various OMB circulars that were referenced to earlier. And also in terms of there's going to be a new general circular that's going to be incorporated or already out, but it won't be a, in effect for you as well. Uh, but in terms of the OMB circulars that apply to you, like a110 and A122, I think you're all nonprofits, or, and so those are the applicable circulars that will, that will apply to you. Um, if you already have federal grants, then we're just one more grant that you have to accept, uh, so you won't really need to do too much in terms of your overall policies. If you're new to federal grants, then yes, you'll need to um, adopt some new policies to ensure that you're in compliance with the required circulars. and. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about what those circulars are as well as where you can find those circulars and get more information. Next, thanks. So what are the key characteristics of organizations with highly effective financial management? We've already talked about written and filed policies and procedures. And, and we talk about that, but why do we talk about it so much? Well, because these are federal dollars you're, you're responsible for. And some of you are getting some very sizable federal grants. We need to be sure that the federal funds are being used in an appropriate manner. We need to be sure they're used in a consistent manner. We need to be sure that the federal funds are treated just like all your other funds. So 
specific policies need to be in place to ensure that that happens. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, train financial staff. As I indicated, you're responsible for significant amounts of federal dollars. So we need to ensure that you have staff who are trained and who are, um, who are knowledgeable about financial practices and general accounting principles and those kinds of things that we would expect. Um, communications, communications is, is so important. I can't tell you how many times I have as a grants officer gone out and do site visits because uh, just like MHM is gonna do site visits for you, I do site visits for various grantees and it becomes obvious that at some point the program people and the fiscal people have not been communicating because I get them into a room and I make them talk, right? And you can tell at some point that communication hasn't happened in terms of what these grant requirements are, what the time reporting requirements are. Very important for everyone involved in the grant, you know, your fiscal people, your program people, your evaluation people. Very important that you have those communications. Very important everyone is on the same, same page. Uh, if you want an effective program, that has to happen. And it doesn't mean, you know, emails every couple weeks or whatever. It really means, I think, you know, a consistent communications, joint meetings, making sure that everyone understands. Um, particularly with regard to program and fiscal people. Um, sometimes in certain organizations, there's just kind of natural walls between them. But when it comes to managing a grant, you really need to be sure that you're all working as a team together to accomplish your goals. Succession planning and cross-training. Some of it's pretty obvious, but people need to be cross-trained, particularly with regard to various reports. Um, your financial reports that are due and your programmatic reports that are gonna be due to, to um, MHM, they're expecting those to come in on time, right? Just like we expect our reports to come in on time. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten memos saying, you know, Mary Jane went on vacation, she's not gonna be back until later, can I have an extension? That's not a reason, that's not an excuse. You need to plan for all your reports and you need to have the necessary backup systems in place. When I tell my grantees, you know, that they're gonna be late or they're asking, I said, well, unless it's a hurricane, tornado, storm, or some other significant thing, then we're just not gonna give a, a, an extension. And obviously that's a little bit of a push, but the point is is that you're responsible for making sure that everyone is cross-trained enough to get your required reports in because it's important to be on time. And the board and finance committee, obviously you're nonprofits, so you have to report to them and it's important for them to know what's going on with your grant. Um, all of you are getting new federal dollars, and I'm sure your board is gonna be interested, particularly the finance committee on your board, in terms of how those plans are being implemented and how those dollars are being spent. So important to keep that communication. Thanks, next. So again, a little bit of extra in terms of policies and procedures. Um, they're written documents. They need to be in place in terms of what needs to be done, how it needs to be done. And the other th important thing about policy and procedures, remember is that if someone's coming down, an auditor's coming down to do your a site visit, or if you're selected to be a, an auditee, the first thing they're gonna do is ask for your policies and procedures. They read those policies and procedures, then they are, in effect, gonna measure you against those policies that you had written. Are you following your procedures as indicated. And if not, there's gonna be a problem. If there's no policies and procedures, in effect, there's certainly gonna be a problem, uh, particularly with the handling of these federal dollars. So I know many of you already have some in place and some of you are gonna to have to add additional policies and procedures, but those are, those are key. And I know we kind of repeat that over and over again, but it is important. And that's something that when MHM comes down and takes a review, they're gonna be looking at and want to see those. 
obviously keeping up to date, important. You don't want to come in and see a policy as dated 1989, hasn't been updated. Um, and everything else with regard to the rationale and the transactions completed forms. So um, we're just kind of emphasizing that fact. Get them done now, get them done early in their program, um, and then the bulk of your work is, is completed. Then it's just a matter of keeping them up to date and keeping them current. Next. So we've already talked a little bit about accounting system, but here's a little bit more information. Um, <clears throat> obviously, our dollars, our federal dollars, need to be kept separate and tracked separately from your match dollars, and obviously from any other operating dollars that your program maintains. So your accounting system must be capable of, of doing that, and you must be capable of, of separating those accounts. It must be capable of tracking them by, by program. You want to be able to track them by budget year. Uh, essentially, your accounting system should be able to produce any kind of report you need at any time on any expense. You also need to do, make a differentiation between direct and indirect costs if you have an indirect cost rate. Um, and of course, it's key that each award and grant be done separately. So most of the time, you'd have a separate cost center assigned to each grant that you track. Uh, many of you have multiple grants, federal grants, state grants. All those obviously need to be tracked separately. And if you're having state money that you're using to, to match your federal money, then you obviously need to track that and see in terms of how you're spending that money in order to meet your match requirements. So all that needs to flow. Now that's something that your accounting people will take care of and handle, but as program people, you need to know that stuff as well. You need to know particularly in terms of what your budget is, right? Um, don't assume, because I've had instances of this happening where program people assume that they have permission to do something and the finance people never approved it, um, or even the other way around, where the finance people are producing reports, and producing reports are fine, but you have to communicate with your program people on what they mean in terms of your budget. I've had situations where program people overspent their budgets and they had to wind up coming up with some other way of paying off salaries and other expenses. So very important <clears throat> as we're talking about communication, but very important that the program people get budget to actual reports. I would recommend monthly reports where you're looking at them and making sure that spending is going as you intended. And if there needs to be correction, you can correct them then as opposed to the end of the year when it's too late. Next, please. And this is just a little bit more information. I think you, it's important, um, this is kind of budget 101, that you be able to compare your outlay with your budgets for each, for each grant. That's what we call a budget to actual. I mean, you do have some flexibility, um, but MHM is the one who provides you that flexibility as your, as your direct funder. And so they've established terms in terms of, they've said they wanted to know about any budget changes, so make sure you communicate those budget changes to them. But in terms of your money and how it's spent and how much money you have, that's something that as program people you need to be very um, mindful of and, and responsible for. Uh, typically the fiscal people will produce the reports and give you the numbers, but you as a program folks have to be able to interpret them and know exactly where you are in terms of spending and where you are in terms of uh, allocated work and work that remains to be done for your grant. Okay, next. So this is just a little, a little um, schematic or a little drawing of terms of how to uh, separate your funds. You need to be able to, this is a scenario where you have a Department of Education grant, <clears throat> then you have a Social Innovation Fund grant, and then you have a Ford Foundation grant, which is obviously private money. Each one of those grants need to be tracked separately, as you kind of see in our little balls in the accounting system. I mean, this is about as elementary as we can put it, but essentially making sure that you're tracking each grant separately, 
that you account for each grant separately. Um, because actually all your funders, no matter where you are, whether you're getting federal funds, state funds, private funds, you probably already know this, they want you to be able to, to report accurately on their funds. So we don't want to see in the bottom a hodgepodge of money just all together. We want it um, split and accounted for separately. Next. Documentation obviously is important um, for these specific informations to track incoming information, to review information. Um, you want to provide evidence of accomplishments and your uh, MHM will want you to be able to do that. And some of these accomplishments will be programmatic as, as well as financial. Um, and the other is to, to prepare for an audit. I think the key that I would, I would say in terms of you as new programs in a new federal grant with a new, with a new uh, grant, grantee in terms of MHM is just be sure that if you can document all your costs. So if I were to come in and I were to look at each and every receipt, you want to be able to sure, or let's say if I went in and looked at General Ledger and I saw something for you know, $12.50, you want to be sure you have a receipt or some documentation for $12.50. And I'm kind of getting down to the, to the real basic level, but you want to be able to be able to provide that level of documentation for several reasons. For one, you want it for your own peace of mind and for your own system to make sure that you know how you're spending your money. Number two, MHM may come down and do a review and start pulling information. And they already indicated they're going to start actually asking for all the documentation for, I think you said, the first three months or so. Um, that might sound like burdensome, but the reality is establishing a good pattern for you, a good habit for you. Because if you have that information, you don't have to worry about somebody coming in and questioning those costs, like an IG audit or something of that nature. Um, as long as those costs are obviously relevant and applicable and allowable. So, um, you know, if you have a receipt for $500 um, for, you know, a tab at, um, at a bar at a hotel, even though you've documented that cost, that cost is not going to fly. <laughs> so, um, I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of some of those prohibited costs, but Alcohol is certainly one of them. Um, also, one of the prohibited costs, just in general, is which kind of makes sense. You certainly can't use the federal money to to uh, pursue or sue the federal government. Um, number three is you can't use federal dollars to lobby, so you can't use it to go to Austin to uh, to lobby for more funds. Uh, so there's a number of key prohib prohibitions in terms of federal funds just kind of across the board. Um, but kind of keep those in mind, okay? So don't lobby and don't drink. Um, and I don't know how that works in Texas. It seems like those two go hand in hand, but in any event, I know in California it does, and, and actually in D.C. it does as well. So, um, but those are a couple prohibitions. Okay, next please. And we've talked, I think, a lot about staff time, and I think um, Peggy and her staff did a good job of going over what we're talking about. The term is time and effort reporting, but in reality, we're really talking about the timesheets, and we're really talking about the fact that it needs to report actual time, not budgeted time. So you might be budgeted 30% on the grant, but you need to charge the actual amount of time that you're actually working on the grant. And that needs to be done on a regular, you know, bi-weekly or monthly basis. So if I come in and if I see miraculously that um, every day you're spending the exact amount of time that t ties to the budgeted, I probably have some concerns about whether or not you're really doing time and actual time reporting as opposed to it would fluctuate from day to day. Now, if you're 100% on the grant, are any of you going to be 100% on the grant? Probably not, okay. Because you're 100% of the grant, that makes it simple because all your time is spent on the grant, right? But if you're not, then you need to separate that out. So it would need to say on your time sheets, it would need to have an indication of, of 
you know, your SIF grant or whatever your, your name you call it, you know, eight hours this day, four hours, three hours, two hours, and then you need to account for the rest of that time as well. So your whole timesheet has to account for your full day, right? So it needs to tie out to eight hours a, eight hours a day. And, and one of the things we kind of press on timesheets because that's one area that we found that we found significant problems with in terms of compliance and that grantees have had issues with or problems with um, not accurately completing these timesheets. So as you start your new grant, it's very good to get in that, that um, habit. It's not just a habit, it's a requirement, but it's good to start with a solid foundation in terms of ensuring that you're doing your timesheets accurately and regularly and ensuring that someone's monitoring that and making sure it happens. There's nothing, there's no scarier feeling than um, being sitting in an office and having someone from the state or federal government come and want to look at your timesheets and you're not able to pull those timesheets. Because um, what happens from that is what we call question costs. Well, that is we're questioning the validity of your, of your charges and what can happen is that we can actually go in and disallow those costs, which means that you have to pay back the federal government. And that's a situation you don't want. We've had those situations in the past and it's not, hasn't been too great for everyone around. Um, also talking about equipment, uh, just, to, just to kind of piggyback on that more. Equipment in the federal terminology is items of $5,000 or more. And so for those things, you would require approval from MHM, and then MHM would have to get approval from the federal government for any of those items. So it's very important you don't go out and buy any cars or vans or any item over $5,000 unless you have specific written prior approval. If you don't, then you could be liable for those costs. We had one grantee um, a couple years ago that authorized um, the subs of purchasing several cars. They did not get prior approval and they wound up having to repay the government about $95,000 for that. So we want to be sure that you have those approvals in place. So this is just another little sketch in terms of tracking your, your various revenues and expenditures. Um, I won't kind of go through it, but you have that on your actually on your sheet, and it's just a kind of a way of just tracking your your CNCS funds, your federal funds, the intermediary funds, your subgrantee funds, and ensuring that they're all separate and you're all match. They're all separate, and they have the systems in order to track it uh, for each and every one of those um, funding sources. So. As we indicated before, we look to the general ledger, which is our accounting system, to have the capability of producing all these reports and all this information we would expect would be in your accounting system. Um, it's obviously important to re review and reconcile the information, and ensure that they're accurate. Uh, for you as uh, sub-grantees, you'll be submitting reports to MHM, and so you want to make sure that they're all, all accurate. And also you have to remember that MHM has to uh, submit financial reports to the federal government, to us, every six months. So they need to use your data as well as their information in order to prepare accurate financial reports. And the financial reports they submit to us includes all the expenditures of federal dollars. It also includes all the match expended, which would be your match and their match. So it's important that you submit accurate data to them so they can submit accurate data to us. And submitting reports on time. I can't kind of, um, I can't stress enough of submitting them on time. Um, we have a system in the federal government and, and the Corporation for National Community Service, which we call eGrants, which is our overall grants management system. So the, all those reports are filed electronically. Now, as a grants officer, I can do a number of different kinds of things with grantees. One thing I cannot do, I can't turn back the hands of time. So if you submit it, those are electronically date stamped, and they're automatically considered late, one day or three days or however many days. So 
um, it's it's really important uh, for those to be submitted on time. Now, for you, you'll be you won't be submitted electronically. You'll be submitting them um, to MHM on the required dates. But still, as part of their overall monitoring and evaluation of you as a program, one of the things they're going to look at: do they submit their required reports on time? So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to manage that. Simple as getting a big old year calendar and circling those dates on the calendar when they're due, as well as electronic tickler systems or whatever, but ensure you get them on time. And if there's some reason, legitimate reason you can't, be sure to request an extension for that. And don't request extension the day before it's due, okay? I mean, that's, we got some recommendation in terms of how I would look at things when I get those. So if there's some real uh, emergency situation that prevents it, um, we do know that those things happen from time to time, um, but uh, don't wait to the last minute to do that. And so I know you already had a session on criminal history checks, so I'm not going to go over all of this. Um, just to note that those are very important and very critical in terms of criminal checks for those individuals who are going to be on the grant. Next. OK, next. So I think in, in kind of in summary, I just would like to say that um, even though you're getting federal dollars, um, and it may seem a little bit intimidating at first, particularly if you're new, um, I would suggest that um, you have capable staff who are willing to help you and assist you. And you can do research on your own as well, but I think the, the key thing is to treat them um, with, um, with a lot of diligence in terms of how they're spent, how they're tracked. Um, and we don't want to put the, you know, the overall situation of, well, you know, track them because someone else might come down and look at them, uh, track them carefully and keep the expenditure. You, know, you want to do that because you want to be a responsible steward of the federal funds that you're getting. And that's, you know, that's the key. And, um, you know, just applying some of these simple techniques, particularly from the very beginning of the grant, will yield lots of success and will put you in compliance with all the various requirements and things. So um, with that, I'm certainly open to any questions you have. Have you had enough financial compliance spoken to you <laughs> this time? Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks for your time and attention.